Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people collectively recorded in my trees. Episode 9, Big George. The subject of my story today is George Main, who is my husband's great-great-grandfather. He was a bit of a mystery to myself and other family members researching him as we uncover that he was a man of several names and there are some formal entries that we still have difficulty accessing. I'm also going to talk to you about George Main's wife and her family so a lot of interesting things popped up in her side as well. So I'll start with George. George William Main was born George Bromley in 1880 in Riddles Creek in the Macedon area of Victoria. The birth record took a lot of tracing down, in fact it's only recently been tracked down due to another family researcher because George was listed as George Brumley with a U. Misspelt names were common in those days due to low literacy levels and this also occurred many times in researching George with Maine as his is spelt with a Y but of course it was also spelt M-A-I-N and M-A-I-N-E in records. George's mother was Alice Bromley. Her father Henry Bromley immigrated with his wife Sarah Ann Crouch, known as Anne, to New South Wales in 1858. Alice was born in Morpeth, New South Wales. By about 1870, the family had moved to Victoria. George was born in 1880, six years before Alice married Edward Sedborough, Maine. When we look at George's birth certificate, it says the father is listed as unknown. It's likely he wasn't the father, however, whether George knew that or not, and simply grew up as a child knowing that his father's surname was Maine, He just took on the name Maine in all of his official documents from then on. Edward Sedborough Maine's father was Irish and his parents emigrated seven years before Edward was born in Gisborne, Victoria on the 5th of August 1859. Edward was 27 and Alice 25 when they married in 1886 and Edward was a carter. They had a son, so a brother, for George, Henry Edward Thomas Main in 1887 in Carlton, Victoria. However, he did not survive infancy. George's mother Alice died in childbirth on the 19th of April 1890 in Carlton, aged only 29, and the child was also stillborn. George was only 10 when his mother died. I'm not sure if he continued living with his stepfather or he went and lived with his mother's family. Edward Sedborough Main went on to marry Annie Darcy, 12 years his junior, in 1893, and they had five children together, four of them surviving infancy. Edward moved his family to Fremantle, Western Australia, by 1909, where he continued his occupation as a carrier. George did not go over to Western Australia with the family. The next time George appears in records is on the 12th of March 1908 when he marries Alice Anne May Gorey in Deniloquin at the Church of England in New South Wales. They had six children. In 1913 and 1927 George is listed in the census as a labourer in Wanganella, New South Wales near Deniloquin. However, by the 12th of June 1929 Alice is living in Tamora, New South Wales without George. She put a warrant out in the New South Wales Police Gazette for wife desertion. He was wanted to pay maintenance of his two children. He was listed as 49 years old. He could go by the name Jack William Main and was last heard of at North Bunnick Station at Canago, just out of Deniloquin. Other family researchers said he was also known as Big George. By July 1932, Alice petitioned a divorce in Parks, New South Wales. She stated to the divorce court that George had deserted her seven years prior and he had been drinking heavily. An article featured in the Western Champion newspaper at Parks, New South Wales on the 4th of July 1932, titled Divorce Case. Before His Honour Judge Markle at Parks Quarter Sessions, a remitted issue from the Supreme Court in divorce was heard 
in which Alice Anne May Main of Parks petitioned for the annulment of her marriage with George William Main. The parties were married in 1908 and there were six children, one of whom died. Mrs Main stated that her husband deserted her seven years ago, having been drinking heavily beforehand and she had not heard of him for about three and a half years. He returned about four years ago when one of the children was believed to be dying and came to the house and abused her. Cooperative evidence was given by a son of the parties and his honour granted the petition. Alice went on to marry Arthur Fairweather in Tomorrow, New South Wales on the 17th of June 1933. He had been married and divorced himself with seven children. He was a silo overseer and Alice died on the 12th of August 1959 in Haberfield, New South Wales, aged 71. Family researchers and myself have tried to no avail to find a death certificate for George, but we keep looking. Based on his children's official documents, it could be narrowed down to 1950. On his son George's death certificate, he names his father as Jack Main, and this reflects Alice's mention of his other name in the Police Gazette. So George's death certificate, wherever it is out there, could have derivations of George Bromley, George Bromley, Jack William Main, James Main and George Main, all with three separate spellings of Main. So you can see how it is a, a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle for us. I'm going to talk to you about Alice and May Gorey's family now. George's wife had an interesting family background. She was the second born child of John Thomas Gorey and Annie Miller and they had eight children. John Thomas Gorey, Alice's father, was born at Gisborne in Victoria on the 12th of May 1854. His father, George Gorey, was a convict. George was born in Romsey, Hampshire, England about 1810. George was sentenced to seven years transportation for stealing three silk handkerchiefs from George Reed's residence at Millbrook in Hampshire, England at the age of 20. He was committed on May the 21st, 1830. His convict record stated he was a labourer, five foot two, dark complexion with no whiskers, brown hair and eyebrows and blue eyes. He was kept in a hulk ship for one month before he departed Southampton, England on the 20th of July, 1830 on the ship John. There was a shortage of prison accommodation in England, so prisoners were transferred to the hulks and the hulks were decommissioned warships that were anchored off in the mud of Woolwich. They were dark, they were damp, they were verminous and few prisoners managed to escape. So luckily for George, one month was quite a short time to be in the hulks. George arrived with 199 other convicts to Van Diemen's Land or Tasmania as we know it today on the 28th of January 1831. His record is quite scant, which is a good thing. It means that he behaved while he was there and he received his ticket of leave in February 1835, allowing him to move to Victoria. He married Eliza Jane Farrell on the 2nd of August 1850 at St Francis Church in Melbourne. Eliza had only arrived in Melbourne five months before from Ireland and was 17 when they married. George was 40. Eliza had only arrived in Melbourne five months before from Ireland. She was listed as a house servant on the shipping records and she came out on an orphan ship. And I'll just divert for a moment and explain what it meant by being on an orphan ship to come out to Australia. The first orphan girls arrived from Ireland to Australia in 1848 and a total of six chip ships including the Eliza Caroline which is the one that Eliza came out on sailed across the world. A total of 4,000 Irish famine orphan girls were sent to Australia with 1,700 of them arriving in Melbourne. The orphans had an important and still widely unknown role in the, in the Australian story and one which countless Australians can claim in their own family story as I can for my husband's family tree. The Great Hunger had decimated the population of Ireland resulting in more than 1 million deaths and 2 million immigrants forced to flee starvation. Between 1849 and 1851, 
The Earl Grey scheme took girls aged from 14 to 19 from workhouses across Ireland to work in Australia as servants and to help populate the new colony. After the horror of starvation and loss of family and home in the Irish famine, surviving the destitution of the infamous workhouses and enduring an arduous sea voyage, the orphans reached a strange and intimidating new land, but they must have had feelings of hope and optimism. An excerpt from the Argus, which was Melbourne's main newspaper of the day, on the 4th of April 1850, said another shipload of female immigrants from Ireland has reached our shores, and yet though everybody is crying out against the monstrous infliction and the palpable waste of the immigration fund furnished by the colonists in bringing out these worthless characters, and that would have been referred to as Eliza's ship. Another excerpt from the Argus on April the 24th, 1850, of a citizen echo society's clamour. The whole country cries out against the further admission into our colony of such degraded beings as the majority of the female orphans have been found. Nor has their cries been raised without reason. For we venture to say, every vessel that brings an increase of this kind to our female population brings a melancholy increase to the vice and lewdness that is now seeming to be rampant in every part of our town. From this class we have received no good servants for the wealthier classes in the towns, no efficient farm servants for the rural population, no virtuous and industrious young women, fit wives for the labouring part of the community, and by the introduction of whom a strong barrier would be erected against the floods of inequity that we are now sweeping every trace of morality from the public thoroughfares of our city. So there were reports that they weren't gratefully received. They felt, residents of Melbourne felt that they were not going to benefit society at all out here. Nonetheless, most orphans flourished. They married and raised families in the harsh conditions of the new colony. Great numbers would live to see the dawn of the new 20th century in their new land. George purchased land in Gisborne, Victoria in September 1851 and by 1852 he had purchased two town lots. So he seemed to be going along pretty well. They had three children, George Frederick in 1852, who died at the age of two, John Thomas, who was born in 1854, and that is who Alice Gorey's father is, and Henry Carr Gorey, who was born in 1856. On the 24th of January 1856, he listed one of the properties for sale in Gisborne as a valuable freehold property fronting Mount Macedon Hotel, consisting of a shop, a dwelling, outhouses and a garden. George then moved to Buttle York where his occupation was listed as a carrier. He had a house and 10 acres. Buttle York was a township west of Sunbury and now an outer suburb of Melbourne. And at this point, it's likely that Eliza did not move with him. She could have even separated from him just before the time that he left Gisborne. Because in 1859, Eliza gives birth to a son, James Wedderburn Gorey, in Gisborne. This child died aged 16 months on the 3rd of January 1861. His father was most likely James Wedderburn Nicholl. She would have had to have named the child Gorey as she was still married to George Gorey. James Nicholl was born in Dundee, Scotland. He was also a convict. He worked at a post office in Woolwich, England and stole a letter that contained a cheque. He attempted to forge the cheque and deposit it into his bank account. As a result, he was given life transportation. He was tried on the 15th of March 1834 in Edinburgh, Scotland. He arrived in Van Diemen's Land on the Lady Kennaway on the 13th of February 1835. He was listed as a clerk on his convict record. His height was six foot one and a half inches, 24 years at the time of transportation, fresh complexion, brown hair, brown eyebrows, a high forehead, an oval long visage, blue eyes and a long nose. He obtained his ticket of leave in March 1843. By June 1856, he'd immigrated to Victoria and was granted the licence for the Bush Inn at Gisborne. In 1857, he was the licensee of the Telegraph Inn. James was 24 years older than Eliza. They had two more children, Frederick Finlay Nicol Gorey, born 1861 and died in 1861. And the third child was recorded with the surname Nicol, Oliver Victor Nicol, 
born on the 22nd of December 1861 and died on the 1st of April 1871 in Gisborne. So in 1871, James places a death notice in the paper for Oliver. There is no mention of Eliza, it just says that he is the son of James W. Nicholl, and you'll see why very soon. In 1865, Eliza gave birth to Elizabeth Jane Gorey. The father was listed as unknown. She was not brought up by Eliza, as in later years. She was told that her mother had died in a fire and she was raised by a family in Gisborne. So remember that Oliver Nicol was born in December 1861 and four years later she has given birth to a daughter with the father listed as unknown and certainly not James Nicol or George Gorey. So it seems that Eliza and James were no longer together and hence why James has put a death notice in because it's looking like he was the one that kept Oliver. So out of the seven children that Eliza has had so far, we have only three that have survived beyond childhood. We've had three that have died two years or younger and then we've also had Oliver Nicholl pass away at the age of 10. By 1868, Eliza married Martin Clune in Fitzroy. Martin was a bootmaker who was born in County Clare, Ireland. Martin was 25 and Eliza was 33. So you've noticed she's gone the opposite direction. Her first two partners were well and truly older than her. This time she's with a man that is eight years younger than her. We are not sure if George Gorey has already died at this stage. I cannot find a clear death certificate for George Gorey. So she either has heard that George Gorey has died and is free to marry or she's committed bigamy. Eliza and Martin had a stillborn son John in 1868 in Carlton. On the 20th of January 1869 her second surviving son Henry Carr Gorey or Harry had to be placed in a home due to his mother being unable to care for him. He was 12 years old at this point. He was in state care for one and a half years and then he was discharged into the care of his stepfather in Carlton. So for some reason, whether it was Henry's behaviour or the fact that she had gone through the death of another child, but at least Harry was returned to his mother and his stepfather only 18 months later. By this stage, Eliza gave birth to another son with Martin, called Martin, and he died at the age of two. Then Eliza had another son, William Martin Clune, in 1871, he died at one year old. So out of the ten children that Eliza gave birth to, only three survived into adulthood. So it must have been awful for her, that many children and them not surviving infancy. But in those days there were, was no immunisation, living conditions weren't great and particularly around the Gisborne area, very cold in the winter. And for her, it would have been very harrowing to have to deal with that amount of deaths of her young children. Eliza died of tuberculosis, aged only 39, on the 16th of September, 1874, in Carlton. So for poor Eliza, after everything she had gone through, the famine, the ship over, having, you know, three partners, multiple children, and dying at such a young age. So we're just going back to Eliza's second born son, John Thomas, or Jack Gorey, who is Alice Gorey's father. He first features in records when he marries Annie Miller in Bendigo, aged 28, at the All Saints Church. His father had moved to Buttle York when he was two, so I'm not sure whether he lived with Eliza when she was with James Nicol or Martin Clune, or if he was brought up by another family. He doesn't feature in the Ward of the State records like his brother Harry or Henry, so I'm unsure who he was brought up with. By 1888, George and Annie had moved to Wanganella, New South Wales. George had obtained a position as a station hand on a property. His brother Harry, or Henry, had arrived in Wanganella only a couple of years earlier, so it's quite possible that um, Henry told him about the possibilities of getting some good ongoing work there, 
and it encouraged him to come up into southern New South Wales. And this is how Alice Gorey and George Main would have met, as George Main was working on Bunnik, and George Gorey, Alice's father, was at Wanganella, that are quite close properties. George and Alice had six children. The eldest child, Alice Lucy Main, who is my husband's great-grandmother, she was born on the 12th of August 1908 in Deniliquin. She married Harold Munro. He was a station hand out at Zara Station at Wanganella. And they had six children. Alice died on the 17th of June 1998 in Deniliquin, aged 89 years. George William Main was the second born child. He was born on the 7th of February 1910. He married Myrene Melba Simpson in Parks. He enlisted in the military on the 24th of December 1941 in Parks at the age of 31 and he was a sapper in the Australian Mechanical Equipment Company. He was discharged from the military on the 8th of January 1946. He divorced Myrene in 1951 in New South Wales and he died on the 10th of November 1974 in Sydney aged 64. His inscription on his grave does say he is the husband of Myrene and, and the loving father of his children. The third born child was Myrtle Annie Main. Myrtle was born in 1912 in Deniliquin. She married Harry Lionel Salt in Parks in 1932. And by 1949, she's living in Haberfield, which was where her mother was living at the time, and her stepfather, Arthur Fairweather. So at this point, it's looking like she's not with Harry anymore. So that's about 17 years since they married. And she died on the 27th of August, 1857 in Ashfield in Sydney. Myrtle was only 45 years old. Iris May Main was born in 1915 in Deniliquin. She died at the age of five on the 10th of January 1920 in Deniliquin and her cause of death was listed as heart failure, complications from a tonsillitis infection. Elsie Main was the fourth child born. She was born in 1916 in Deniliquin. I cannot find a death record for her, which makes me presume that maybe she was a stillborn child or died quite young. And the youngest in the family, Lindsay John Main, was born on the 6th of November 1923. He married in Ashfield, New South Wales, to Bridget Mary Dillon. He lived at Granville. He was a battery fitter as his occupation. And he died on the 5th of April 1996 at Palmdale on the Central Coast. I'll just now give you some information on John Thomas Gorey and Annie Miller's children. We've already covered Alice Gorey. The first born was George William Gorey. He was born in 1885 in Sandhurst, Victoria, which we now know as Bendigo. At the age of 37, he married Letitia Rose Barton at the Renmark Methodist Church in Renmark, South Australia. He then owned land. He was a share farmer at Teldra, South Australia, until 1943 when he moved up to Alice Springs. He was a pastoralist with his brothers James and Thomas on Yambar Station in the Northern Territory and he died in 1957, aged 72. Henrietta Gorey is another child. She was known as Etta. She was born in 1891 in Deniliquin. She married Thomas Bell O'Reilly in Deniliquin at the age of 18 in 1909. And Thomas was a farmer from Griffith, so they moved up in the Griffith Gulgawi area. She died on the 6th of June 1946 in Alice Springs at the age of 55. John Henry Alfred Gorey. He was married in Deniliquin on the 31st of July 1892. By the time he's 22, he's living in Alice Springs. He was a well borer, so a boring contractor that would bore the wells for water up in the Northern Territory 
and he then by the time it came to 1954 he was in a pastoralist at Yamba station with his brothers he was living at Darwin in 1963 and he died aged 73 on the 25th of September 1965 in Alice Springs Mary Emily Gorey, she was born on the 15th of April 1895 in Wanganulla. She married Frank Alfred Loy on the 29th of October 1914 in Deniliquin when she was 19. And she died in Cootamundra on the 6th of June 1946, aged 51. James Charles Gorey was born in 1896 in Deniliquin. He lived in the Hilston area when he was 36 and then moved up to the Northern Territory by 1933 and he worked on Yambar Station with his brothers and died on the 25th of November 1948 in Alice Springs. Thomas Ernest Gorey was born in 1899 in Deniliquin. He was also in Hilston 1932 and up at Yambar Station by the time he was in his mid-50s and he died in 1976 at Alice Springs. And the youngest in the family, Evelyn Grace Gorey. She was known as Molly. She was born in 1903 in Deniliquin. And she married James Joseph McGrady in 1935 in Griffith. Unfortunately for Evelyn, her husband died in the Prince of Wales Military Hospital in Randwick at the age of 46 in 1944. So she found herself with quite young, two children under 10, um, that she took care of. She then moved up to Croydon in near Sydney in 1943. In 1947 she was the matron of the St John the Baptist's Hostel in Alice Springs for a year and it was the residence of Outback children that attended school. She was still living at Alice Springs at uh, 69 years old. I've been unable to find a formal death certificate for her and just a little bit of information on Henry Cargory, who was the only one of three surviving children of a life. He, as you know, was in care and then returned to his mother and stepfather. He married Margaret Elizabeth Burnell at the age of 22 on the 12th of July 1878 in Carlton. By the time he was 27, he was widowed and they already had three children. He then went on to marry Alice Eustace Malthouse Brearley at Wanganella on the 24th of May 1885 at the age of 29 and they went on to have a whopping 13 children together. So with Henry Carr Gorey he ended up having one child survive from his marriage to Margaret Elizabeth Burnell, Louisa Margaret and then he went on to have the other children with Alice. He was a storekeeper at Wanganella in February 1902. Uh, there's a, a couple of ads in the paper. One says in 1904, it says, Notice, H. Gorey's IXL store, Wanganella. H. Gorey wishes to draw the attention of all those who have occasion to visit Wanganella that he has built a new store near the bridge and wishes to thank all past favours and trusts that they will not forget to call in in future. Everything man, woman, boy or girl requires will be found within that little store if you will only call in and see H. Gorey. At the age of 45, he had a home that he called Fitzroy Cottage at Wanganella. He then moved up to North Yanko in the Murrumbidgee region in his late 50s. Henry surrendered his land on the 2nd of August 1913 up at Leeton. It's quite possible that he, he gave it a bit of a go in the Yanko Irrigation area, but possibly wasn't too successful in that venture. And he died at Leeton on the 21st of December 1926, aged 70. So out of the children that Eliza and George had, they the boys certainly did well at continuing the family name. And let's not forget Eliza Farrell's daughter, Elizabeth Jane Gorey. So we know that she was born in 1866 in Gisborne. We're not sure who brought her up, but she did marry at the age of 23 to Carsten Frederick Costa 
in Fitzroy on the 30th of March 1889 and Carsten was a driver and they lived in Footscray and the Sandringham Cheltenham areas and she had five children of her own. She passed away at the age of 80 on the 7th of May 1946 at Sandringham in Victoria. So this story of Big George had it all. Convicts, illegitimate children and at least one death record that cannot be found. If you have a family history story you would like me to share in a future episode or you need help in adding a little more information to people in your family tree, go to my Facebook page, Family History Mysteries, to send me a message.